and we'll get started. So I had the superintendent, just you know, he's on his way here to tra bad traffic. He's on speakerphone, and now we are recording. So we will. Uh, Thank you, Chief Miller. So, first of all, I think we've already all signed in. Um, I thought before we get started, one of the first things we want to do is do a welcoming and introductions. Um, I will start with um, uh, Superintendent. Do you want to start with uh, with yourself as far as welcoming the, the committee? Well, I, first of all, I'd like to welcome the committee. Um, this is Mr. Cohen's committee, and I great respect and I owe deference to Mr. Cohen. I appreciate the opportunity to go first. I've been out on the West Cape with uh, listening dialogues with principals, assistant principals. I just finished with 35 of our wonderful teachers um, and I am caught in a bit of traffic trying to get back to the greater Fort Myers area. I'm already in the car. I apologize for not being there right from the very beginning, but I don't think it'll be too much longer before I'm standing in front of all of you. Um, I believe in the work of the audit committee. This is one of our vital committees when it comes to not just keeping an eye on things, but I think the more important or as important work that comes out of it is the ability for us to get better. What I love about an audit process is it's a continuous improvement process. You audit, you have findings, you correct, you re-audit. And I really appreciate the focus of this group and the expertise that's in the room. And if any members are new, um, I can only tell you that when we get the next technology results back, please, please, please come to that meeting because between the audit committee members in our instructional technology department, it's like watching a foreign language be spoken. Um, and I really appreciate we have the right people in the room on this team and um, just want to thank you for the opportunity to be a non-voting sort of standby member. And um, as I said, I am without violating any laws, I am coming as quickly as possible. And thank you for understanding that part of the superintendent's responsibility is getting voice to decisions that are coming in my time with these teachers. In the last 16 dialogues I've had and another 14 to go is really vital um, in helping to inform leadership and do the right thing. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, sir. So we'll go ahead and start, I think we'll start around the table. Um, the Board Attorney Kathy Bruno, do you mind starting first and going sure. on with you and going on Absolutely. Us? So my name is Kathy Dupree Bruno. I am the School Board Attorney and the General Counsel for the District. Welcome to the Audit Committee. I know a lot of you were here last year. And for those of you who are new, welcome forward. My name is Gerard Carrington. Um, <clears throat> I work for the Florida Adult Coach University. Uh, I was here last year. Had a a lot of fun, learned a lot, a lot, a lot, and as the superintendent said, you know, it's it's a strong group that takes the decisions that we make and the, the what's being asked of us very seriously. So it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. My name is Andrew Sun. I'm also a returning member of the committee, and probably the only member who's a product of. The county public schools. Um, so went to public schools and came back home after I graduated from Florida State. Um, and I want to echo what the superintendent said. And the part that I've enjoyed the most about this committee has been um, about getting it right. Um, whatever process or whatever we're looking at, it's always been about how do we make sure we're doing best by the taxpayers, the students, and the faculty of the district to make sure that the process. Uh, the resources are always being used as efficiently as possible. So glad to continue to do that work. Hi, my name is Jim Ward. I am new to the committee. Um, I was asked by Sam Fisher to participate in this committee. Um, just a little bit about my background. I'm currently uh, serve as a councilman at the uh, Starwell Village, which I've been doing for the last two years. Uh, prior to that, in my retirement life, I've worked on board of directors as treasurer and president of director of the board of directors. Uh, and my background is in finance and accounting. Okay. My name is Paul Cohen. I had the honor of serving as uh, committee chair last year. Um, I have 40 years in audit and consulting services relating to audit, accounting. Um, and I want to read what was brought out. It is like hearing foreign languages sometimes in the room. However, the individuals who have been brought forward, and I can only 
would echo that the individuals appointed for this year will bring significant value to the taxpayers, administration, and everybody else. And also want to state that staff has been instrumental in assisting us as well in that audit process. My name is Butch Slink. I'm a returning member. Background is in um, insurance and then kind of aerospace distribution. Um, I don't have much to add besides what you guys have added. I think the, the only thing I guess I can add is there's in the aerospace part of my business, you we bring in third party auditors twice a year. It's critical because you are blind to your own dilemmas. And so I, I think there's um, the superintendent and the administration wants us here to basically help improve things. So that's all I got. Dan Sears and I, uh, I was a uh, school board candidate. Uh, this last go around, and it was an honor to uh, kind of get out and meet the candidate to see some of the details of, of kind of the workings, although it won't be as in-depth as this, and that's why I'm looking forward to this board. Uh, Chairperson uh, Jada Langford recommended me for the uh, for the board, and I was happy to accept it. Uh, my background a little bit is uh, 22 years. I was a naval officer, Blue and Navy fighters, uh, retired commander, and then eight years in the Minnesota legislature uh, uh, on various committees, both finance and policy committees. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, kind of seeing how we as a group will uh, maneuver to improve the confidence that the taxpayers should have in their school district. Armor Parsons, I'm chair of the school board right now. And I know we're looking forward to the recommendations that y'all make to the board. You know, it's too much for any board member to know everything going on in every committee. So as they feed into us, this is one of the most important committees there are. I actually came off the finance committee because I was on both the finance and the audit and I don't think the same person should be on both of those. You know, I mean, most nonprofits have not done that way in other places. But I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dave Newell. I'm the Executive Director of Safety and Security and Emergency Management for the School District. Um, prior to that, I did over 30 years in law enforcement with the Cape Coral Police Department. I retired as police chief and then came here um, after that. Uh, I'm not a uh, stranger to audits. I'm uh, very familiar with audits. We've been audits all the time in the city of Cape Coral. I'm also a, a team leader assessor for national accreditation, so I'm very familiar with assessing departments and uh, always look for best practices. So I look forward to being a liaison to this committee. Um, anything you need, um, you always feel, feel free to ask me. I'll give myself if you don't have it tonight, but I'm always there if you have any questions. Thank you. And I'm Don Rebels. I'm the recording secretary for the audit committee, but in my daytime world, I am his administrative assistant. So I don't know who keeps who busier, but we keep each other straight. <laughs> so in the agenda, as you can see, um, <coughs> next normally we would probably move the election of officers. We thought because uh, we have some new members that with uh, Attorney Bruno, uh, thought would be, we also believe that we would do the review of the Parliament procedures, the review of Sunshine Law, um, and then at that point afterwards we could go into the election. Officers. So with that, um, do you have, are you sitting right now? Yeah, I just asked a quick question. Um, how long has the audit yeah. been, committee been in together? When did it first start? Approximately, um, March 2022, approximately. It's a new committee. Yes, yeah. November 2021. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. November 2021. Why should we go I had yeah. a sense it was new, but I just want to be yeah. sure. <clears throat> We're just going to get the, um, the PowerPoint set up. Wonderful. And just so I have an idea, because I know that I'm among colleagues who are very learned um, individuals, how many of you are familiar with Robert's Rules? Okay, so pretty much everyone. So we won't spend too, too much time. We'll just touch base on that. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to bring to your attention, you should have a copy of that, are the three policies that um, are really important for you to read. We're not going to go through them. The first is 1.17, which is the school board internal audit function. 
1.171 audit committee and 1.172 auditor selection procedures. And what you'll find um, in these particular documents is pretty much what your responsibilities are. I'll touch the highlights of it, but everything that you need to know to be able to help the board and its fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers from both financial and operational audits. Um, I do want to just bring to your attention that we are in the process of converting all of our policies uh, through NEOLA, so these um, numbers will change by the end of this particular fiscal year for school board. Just to touch base a little bit, Board Policy 1.17 is the one that really outlines the three main goals and the responsibilities and the purpose of this committee. One is to help the board in selecting its board auditor. That's one. Two, to assist the internal auditor, the board auditor, with creating the annual audit plan. And then three, to provide guidance and expertise to the school board concerning audits, relevant investigations, for board policy 1.17 and 6.06. Um, the board policy 1.171 also says that there are seven voting members of this committee and four non-voting members of the committee. So all of you have been appointed by a school board member are considered voting members. And then there's four non-voting, which will be the chairman, I'm sorry, he's my chairman, the board liaison, Mr. Persons, um, um, the superintendent, myself, and somebody from finance is usually here. Mr. Newland serves as a staff liaison. He works with you if anything that you need from staff, anything that you need from the board, coordinates everything and helps the audit um, committee function and provides us assistance. And then of course, Don is his right hand and also our recording secretary. The other thing that um, the board is expecting from you in this role is to help provide some oversight, assist. And when we mean oversight of the board auditor, again, is to help create that board audit plan. When that board auditor has completed their plan, um, they come to you and they say, here are our findings, you review that. And then you may make some additional recommendations to the school board. In addition is to help the school board because there are a lot of technicalities in these audits that they may not understand. So it's also to help the board with guidance, to help them um, problem solve, to help give them recommendations. What is really important for you to know about the audit committee is that this is a committee because it is a fact finding committee that falls under the open governance law, which is the Sunshine Law. Basically, under the Sunshine Law, meetings and discussions between two or more board members fall under Sunshine, which means it must be done in the open, in a publicly noticed meeting, um, where public can attend, and that minutes are taken. That's the basics of the Sunshine Law. Discussions that you have on um, social media, which I'm sure that you don't, but uh, anything that is a technological discussion, social media, emails, etc., those are all considered discussions amongst members. So you need to be very careful with that. And I have a slide that talks about this. And then I, okay, I'm gonna go back to my joke, Don. No. <laughs> hey, he's good, not me. <laughs> so in this particular, this is just to prove my point about um, being careful about what you say on Facebook and blogs. In this particular um, cartoon, the teacher's like, hey, I don't wanna hear about what you did over the summer via Twitter. I want you to report it to the class like everybody else. So that's that's what we want to be careful with. All right, so um, again, this is a fact-finding committee. All of the meetings, open, notice, minutes taken, and records must be maintained. And that's what Dawn is here for. She's going to help us keep those minutes. And then um, Dave and his staff, they maintain that on behalf of the superintendent, who's ultimately responsible as the board secretary to do that for us. Um, meet participating the electronic meeting. So a couple of years ago, right after COVID, um, there was a new law that was passed that allows these types of board advisory committees to meet in person or to meet um, via, via um, telephonic or Zoom or other means like that, um, video conferencing. So we have the option to do that. I know last year pretty much everybody met in person, but that is a decision that you will have to make at some point to determine how you want to conduct your meetings virtually or if you want everybody to come. Some committees even do hybrids. What is really, really important for anyone who is on a board advisory committee and as well as my members of my board 
is that you do not use intermediaries to exchange information, meaning um, Mr. Swank calls uh, Ms. Susie C to tell Mr. Cohen how he's going to vote or what his thought is on a recommendation that's coming before the board. Even though it's not direct communication between Mr. Swank and Mr. Cohen, it is still a violation of sunshine because you are using an intermediary to communicate that information. It's called daisy chaining and that is a violation of law. The other thing I wanted to um, share with you, not so much this committee, but I do have some other board advisory committees that like to do breakout sessions. Let's do some subcommittees um, so we can narrow down an issue or maybe even in a group we wanna break down and have discussions. We need to be very, very careful with those subcommittees because there are laws that apply to that, which basically says you can't have these breakout sessions that are inaudible to the public. Remember, open governance is for members of the public to not only hear what your vote is, but to understand the analysis of how you came to that vote. So they need to be able to hear everything that is being said. So there's some laws that um, dictate what you can and can't do with the, relates to that. If for some reason, at some point, if the committee says we need a subcommittee or we want to break out, let me know and I will make sure that it's properly noticed us so that we are in compliance with the law. Our committee meetings are always videotaped. This is not statutorily required, but it is board required. It is in our policy. They want all these meetings videotaped and come into. Um, public has access to come into these meetings at any time. It's noticed on the calendar, so they're welcome to come in. And they can make a public comment. You will designate the time when you want the public to be able to make the public comment, but know that they can do that. Uh, the board asks that you have a professional decorum and that we use Robert's Rules of Order to help with that professional decorum. Another thing that's very, very helpful um, or that you really should understand is that everything that happens in this committee uh, in terms of documentation is considered a public record. So if you're sending an email with regards to this committee's business, know that it is a public record. All of these documents that we provided you with today, that is a public record. So just be very mindful of that. Um, again, electronic communications, et cetera, email is a public record. You can go to the next slide. The one thing that I do want you to remember with regards to public records and communication. This is why we have Mr. Neal in here as your staff liaison. Um, the law allows for committee members to communicate with staff. So that's why you're gonna get emails from Dave or you'll get emails from Don that says, here's the time that we're meeting, here's your agenda, here's a particular topic. What you have to be very careful with is engaging in conversation with those emails. For example, if Mr. Ward says, um, I have an idea that I would like for you guys to consider, I'm planning to do a motion that says this. Mr. Ward is able to do that and send it to all of the committee. Best to send it through Mr. Newland, and Mr. Newland will distribute it to everybody. Where the violation occurs is if um, Mr. Davis comes in and says, I, want, I don't think I agree with this. This is not what we should do. And you start having that conversation in the email. That becomes a central violation. Now, I know that everyone is very familiar in this group with parliamentary procedure. So I'm going to skip a couple of slides and go to the one that talks about the chair's responsibility. Um, just a couple of highlights. Obviously, your chair is the person who's going to conduct your meetings. Your chair is the one that's going to count your votes. Your chair is going to help with the motions that are prepared and make sure that they're executed properly. Um, and your chair is going to make sure that the motion is restated prior to your vote so everybody understands and ensures that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Because as we know for Robert's Rules of Order, the main thing is that the majority rules but the minority always has a right to speak, and that's the whole purpose, and why we want to make sure we follow that. So, I know you guys are all good, and you understand this, but just tell me, how do you make a motion? I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Address the chair and say I move. I move such and such, such and such. And then what's supposed to happen next? Second. What happens if there's not a second? The motion dies. Okay. So, 
Uh, Mr. Cohen, you were chair last year. So once the motion is made and the second, what's the next step? Open for discussion. Open for discussion. And as chairman, he's going to try to make sure that all of his colleagues have an opportunity to speak, right? And you want to be careful that not one person dominates the discussion, but everybody has an opportunity. Once, Mr. Chairman, the discussion is concluded, what happens? I repeat the motion and then call for a vote on the motion. And then everybody votes. And then if we go to the, to the um, oh, I got to do this. This one's <laughs> I got to find it, though. So this one is so good. So the motion's on the floor. Now what do you do? A motion has been made and seconded that this be one of those meetings where nothing actually gets done. That's the chairman's job to make sure that something gets done. Right? So this is one of my slides. I try to remember that for my board. The next slide, please. And then these are just some tips. You want to make sure, obviously, that we're respectful. And I know all of you are professional individuals, so I have no concerns about that. Um, but you just want to make sure that we respect each other's time, we respect each other's positions, and we listen. Next slide. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to go back before your vote. So what, in this particular slide, um, sometimes we have heated discussions. I did not see this last year in this committee, but sometimes that happens and it continues and continues and continues. Well, there's a couple of options. One, you can do what this lady is saying. If you don't stop talking about your first wife, I'm going to start talking about my next husband. Or you can do what this group is saying. At this point in the meeting, we'll open a discussion of whether or not we needed to have this meeting at all. So we're just not accomplishing anything. But that's not the best way to go about it, Mr. Chairman. What do you do? You call the motion. And any of you can do that, right? You can call for the vote. Whenever One key thing with Robert's rules is whenever you are limiting somebody's right, which is the right to discuss, you do want to make sure you have a, a supermajority vote, a two-thirds vote. Okay? Whenever you're limiting, just rule of thumb in Robert's rules. Next slide. Here is um, something that I find very, very important. What do you do after the vote? Ms. Chairman has um, did his job, seconded, discussion, called for the vote, vote has been cast, now he's going to do what? Repeat. Or I Re repeat the approved motion. Okay. Or say this is, you know, yeah, he's having it. How do you do yes. that? But what is also, go back one slide, please. What is also really important, though, <clears throat> to me, is the most important thing from Robert's rules after the vote and after the chairman announces the vote. Make part of the record. Make part of the record, but you respect the vote, right? Because remember what Robert's rules is, majority votes, but minorities have right. We have the right to listen, and you have the right to change my mind. But once that vote is done, you accept the vote. Shake hands, let's move on, next topic. And sometimes that's hard. Okay. All right, the next thing I wanted to um, just bring to your attention, just a couple of things where I think sometimes people get tripped up, is um, amending a motion. How would you, let's say that the motion is to recommend to the school board that RSM do an audit on, um, I don't know, HR, okay? No, I don't think it's HR we need to audit. I think we need to audit legal. How do you accomplish that? You would look to amend the motion. And how do you do that? I guess requesting the chair to amend the motion. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to amend the motion by changing HR and, input, and putting in legal, right? But what? here's where people get tripped up sometimes. So now you have a recommendation for a, an amendment to the motion to replace those two words. You have to vote on that amendment. Okay, body, do you agree to remove HR and put legal? That's the first vote. It has to be seconded first. And it has to be seconded, exactly. But that's your first vote. After the body says, yes, we do, we agree to remove that word and put legal in there. Then you vote on the motion as amended. Okay, so that's one place people do get tripped up. So you don't have to say, you don't have to vote no on the first amendment, first, first motion. You just simply amend it. Exactly. And you can, for Robert's rules, if you're going to be a stickler, you can do that amendment up to two times. Okay. Um, sometimes 
if it comes starting to get really kind of messy and you got a lot of amendments and you have this and you're dividing, it's okay for the person who did the motion, who's hearing the conversation, to just say, I withdraw my motion. That stops that. And I'm going to restate my motion this way. Sometimes that's the easier route to take. Just remember that. Um, the other thing I wanted to just point out is point of order. Anybody know about point of order? Dr. Brainer's done that to me several times now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar with it. <laughs> you were making that up. <laughs> it's true, and I was on a line. You called me. It was, it was, it was, well, it was just well deserved. So, and, and he hit the key word, I don't mind. Even if there's a problem that's going on, we're not on topic, we're not following the agenda, you know, we're supposed to be talking about legal's audit, but all of a sudden we're back talking about HR's audit, point of order, let's get back to what we're here for, let's go back to the germane issue. Okay? That's usually what point of order is for. And then there's some other things that are um, a little bit more point of information, I don't understand, um, point of personal privilege, but we don't need to go into all of that. I'm going to be here if you need any assistance. Another <coughs> chairman from last year, and I'm sure all of you individuals, because of your backgrounds, will be um, more than capable to handle um, this particular committee and parliamentarians. But I'm here if you if you need assistance. Any questions? <coughs> I think the only other thing is good of the order. <coughs> so at the end of your meeting, you know that you have an opportunity to just share the good of the order in terms of. You know, any comments that you may have? Any questions for me? Yeah. Yes. Um, going back to Sunshine, mm -hmm. the one thing that we, an issue that occurred last year, and you offered a legal opinion, but the new members were not privy to that. If we get into a discussion, let's say it involves encryption or a technological question that if it comes out on public record, it could expose the district. We do have the ability to go into an executive session, excuse a member of the public from that meeting, as long as we were genuinely discussing just that highly confidential information. As your Cohen hit the nail on the head, he's absolutely correct. As a member of this committee, you will have access to some very sensitive information. Now, the law says that there is some information that is too sensitive for even the public to be able to hear. And when we have those discussions, that's when we go to what they call executive session, which is a private session with just the members of this committee and whoever is giving us the information to be able to discuss outside of the sunshine, outside of the public's view. Those will be things like cybersecurity. If you have an audit with regards to safety and security, um, if you have an audit with regards to our collective bargaining, if you have an audit with regards to risk management, there are certain things that we can go ahead and do this private session. And I will be here, just like Mr. Cohen said, to provide legal advice as to whether or not, in this case, we can do it or we can't. And secondly, the goal, obviously, is to meet in person. However, the auditors last year, based on logistics, were not able to be physically here. So we did hold a number of Zoom meetings mm -hmm. so that we could have all parties from the audit team available for discussion with the audit committee. Yeah, because RSM, who is our board auditor, they are not physically located in Fort Myers, Florida. So sometimes they were able to come down and be present at their main office in Tampa, and sometimes they participated by Zoom, exactly as Mr. Cohen said. Any other questions, comments? Can there be executive session on an electronic meeting? So, yes. Um, however, you know I'm going to have a however. The board is currently working on a policy that discusses executive session. You are different than um, the board. So yes, you can have your um, meetings, but it will depend on how you vote. So if you vote now to have to have that leeway, that's fine. If you vote not to, then a person may be able to attend if they're sick, if they have a significant issue, if they're um, out of town for business, you may be able to attend. So it really depends on how this audit committee wants them to work. But um, no, but specifically, it can yes, it can have an executive session. Whatever you choose today will apply to your executive session. Okay. 
Can you play hi, Mr. David Fillmore? You can see you again. Long drive. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? So therefore, he needs to go back through the education component. One question that um, has been um, asked of me a couple of times from other um, committees is what happens with my personal email address? If there is a public records request, am I obligated to go into my personal Gmail account and find all those records for you? If you make sure that whenever you're communicating about audit business that you're CCing Dave Mullen and Don Rebels, you do not have to do that because our system will capture all of those. So go to public records because we will be able to fulfill it if you're including our staff in the email, which you should always do. Thank you very much. All right, so if we go back to the agenda, we're going to go back up to where we have election of officers. And this is where we select the chairperson and the vice chair, which is the last time. Kathy's going to help out, just in case. But basically, the object is to you can either nominate yourself or somebody else as the chair. Once we do that, we'll also do the vice chair. Nominate Mr. Cohen for chair. So let's 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 do let's do it right. So at this time, nominations are open. So we have one nomination for Mr. Cohen as chair. Are there any other nominations? I would Andrew, uh, nominate Anderson. Okay. Sure. I, I appreciate the nomination, but I'll uh, defer to Mr. Cohen and, okay. and withdraw my name. Okay. Anybody else would like to nominate chair? Mr. Cohen, are you willing to accept the nomination of chair? Yes, I am. At this time, nominations are closed. All those in favor of Mr. Cohen, please indicate by raising your hand. Seems that we have a unanimous vote. Seven individuals. At this time, nominations are open for vice chair. Any nominations for vice chair? I nominate Mr. Smite for vice chair. A nomination for Mr. Smite. Any other nominations for vice chair? Move to close nominations. Nominations, have, it's been moved to close nominations. Uh, nominations are now closed. All those in favor of Mr. Swank being vice chair, please raise your hand. You're abstaining. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Check with your intern and sign up with this job. Probably <laughs> 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 not. Blood panels and everything. <laughs> At this time, Mr. Swank has been elected vice chair. Vote is 7 0. So, congratulations to Mr. Cohen, our chair, and Mr. Swank, our vice chair. Mr. Cohen, I turn over the meeting to you. And I fully agree with what Mr. Boyd Bruno brought out. Um, the goal of these meetings is to be as efficient and effective as possible. Um, sometimes, do against our ability to try to stick to a one-hour timeline, we do run beyond. So what I offered last year, and I'll leave it open to this committee, is to do what I call a soft close and a hard close. So my soft close, ending the meeting at 7 o'clock, if you actually have to leave, by all means. However, sometimes we may run until 7.30 because we are delving very deeply into an issue and it just cannot end and we don't want to table the issue. So I'm hoping that the members of the committee can be on board with that type of request. I respect all of your time, and I especially respect all the talent that is around this room. Um, the last thing I want to bring out is, yes, I was elected your chair. To me, this is a team effort. Mr. Davis last year brought forth significant knowledge in the information technology audits, and it was vital to have somebody with his knowledge sitting at this table. And we have other committee members as well who have brought forth a lot of very good questions and a lot of unbelievable knowledge. And I know the new members will report that same talent to the table. Um, the one motion I will request relates back to the question that was posed relating to utilizing Zoom versus mandating all meetings be held in person. And I'd like to poll the members of the committee and obtain your opinions, starting with you, Mr. Carrington. 
I think it should have uh, a for a woman, um, for virtual. Absolutely in favor of the option for virtual. I favor the option as well. Um, just a question, does it has to be everyone on Zoom? Or can a one or two individuals be on Zoom and arrest in person? <clears throat> Mr. Bruno, so, can we do that? So depending on how you decide, you may have a hybrid where you have some individuals in person and some by Zoom. Um, I will share that um, there were committees who, are, who have done that and have had some difficulty with that. Difficult, I'm sorry. Yes, no, please. No, just difficulties in what in, context? In that you may have like two people here, seven people on Zoom, or that there's communication, I can't hear exactly what you're saying, just technolo technological type of issues as well as um, the ability to fully participate. Sometimes if you're doing Zoom, it's easier for everybody to be on Zoom and everybody's participating in the same way. Or if you're in person, it's easier to be in person, everybody's participating. Hybrids, they do work, we do, you are allowed to do that, but I have had committees who have had problems. Hey, just Mike, I'm all for Zoom. Yeah, I, I, I would opt for the option. I think having the option open is beneficial as an option, so I agree. And I will entertain a motion relating to how we wish to hold our meetings on a going forward basis. Whether it be hybrid, Zoom, or mandated in person, this way, we have it on record as to how we wish to hold our meetings on a going forward basis. Um, well, <clears throat> my motion would be to the default to be Zoom, and with the option to, uh, if it is that we need to meet in person, that we meet in person. Okay. And then it makes um, it makes sense, probably, if because everybody has a long drive and. Some of us, <clears throat> it's going to be, traffic is exceptionally challenging these days. That doesn't seem like it's going to go away. But it stands a reason that like if our ascent is here, those seem like more logical reasons to be here in person versus if we're going with something else, then it probably seems more attractive to be here for just to make everybody's lives easier and to basically make sure everybody's present. So I just wanted to, I, I see the rationale behind both thoughts. So I'm just kind of advocate for probably having it's conceivable to have all three options open trend, trend or tend to focus on Zoom, but obviously in favor of RS, uh, RSM meetings in person. Mr. Carrington, do you wish to amend your motion or do you wish to move forward with the motion as stated? <laughs> I, th I think we're saying the same thing, except yeah. it's uh, the part that I have a I, I, in my view, I have a little, we, we deal with boards also at the university, and there is distinct, when it's both in person and uh, virtual, there are all kind of problems. It, 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 there are usually something that goes wrong. I, I will, I can, um, I'll, Well, I'll I'll remove my uh, um, my motion. Well, wait, just for clarification, I was agreeing with you. I was not. I was not trying to amend it. I was. I was just amending your your argument. So. Just just as a, as a matter of discussion, I think we would all agree that the preference would be that if we would be Zoom, we would all be there. If it's in person, we'll all make every attempt. I just think turning the opportunity for someone to at the very least listen in. Um, to the conversation, if it's harder to have feedback um, from that opportunity, I think it would just be a disservice. So, but I, I think we would all agree that, yeah, those hybrid meetings make it hard to have that full conversation. Mr. Chair, point of information. Yes, please. Uh, how often does it come here? We were meeting in coordination with RSM's audit plan last year. Um, as we've now implemented a full year audit plan with RSM, I would like the committee to meet more frequently. Um, that will be a second question that I will be putting out to the committee as to frequency of meetings. Yeah. Okay, we do have a motion on the and table. Just, I need a I second would, before. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, just a point of order. I, I will 
we'll be out of town for a couple of months during the summer, and that's the reason why I would prefer to do Zoom at time. I have done Zoom on numerous occasions for board meetings and even for council meetings at the Village of Estero. Uh, honestly, I, I have not had any issues at all with, with that, if, and particularly with, with the Zoom meetings that are in place now. Uh, in prior times, when you just use telephone, um, it, there could be some issues, but generally speaking, the Zooms work very well. But it just as a point, um, that, that's my only concern. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Before we get too much further, can Mr. Carrington restate his motion, please? I want to make sure I have it. The motion was to the default meetings to be virtual with the option for in-person meetings when the need arises. Yep, I'm good now. Thank you. I require a point of clarification. Which would be the priority, Zoom or in person, based on your motion? Default, default is Zoom. Okay, so, so in person would be number one option, Zoom being a secondary option. No, no, no I was saying the other way. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? With that said, the motion, and I'm going to give a synopsis of the motion, would be to hold meetings via Zoom with a secondary option of being in-person meetings. With that said, can I have a vote, please? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> okay, we have one opposed. Any abstentions? Okay, with the record show, six to one in favor of the motion. Who is the abstention, please? Mr. Sanders, so. The next question, as Mr. Severson raised, and it's a valid question, frequency of our meetings for the coming year. As I said last year, we were a new committee. It was a little bit more of a challenge to determine frequency of meetings and coordination with RSM because the board only approved two audits. And we also approved some follow-up work and some other work to be conducted by RSM for this year. At our committee meeting last year, we approved a much more in-depth audit plan for the current year. So we would have the ability to meet more frequently than we did last year and not just be at the whim of RSM's availability or completion of audits. I will open that up to discussion of the committee. A monthly meeting structure generally will work, and I, I think you're right. I think there'll be more business that will justify that meeting. And then uh, I think just in whatever motion that we would make, I would be acceptable with giving the chairman the ability to not call the meeting if there's no business before us, um, just so that we don't have to I'll get here to formally say there's something to do. I'd like to raise a point that I think that's an excellent idea because then we're probably not going to be settled with two hour long meetings because we're taking too long in between updates. So I think that's a very smart solution. And I would agree with that thought process as well. It makes sense. We can get updates, which RSM does provide to staff. Staff can then provide it to the members of the committee. And based on the status update, a determination can be made whether or not it is valid to hold a meeting that particular month or because of limited work being performed during the course of that audit for us not to meet. It also will give us the ability to determine whether or not we need to add additional audits into the audit plan for the coming year. So I would agree with what Mr. Sun said. If I can get that in the form of a motion, please. Mr. Chair, are you also looking to set time and day while we have to go up and just do it all in one fell swoop here? I think that might be challenging because I don't know if everybody has their calendar in front of them and to say we'd like to hold our meeting the third Thursday of the month might be a little bit challenging for folks if they don't have their calendar in front of them. So I think if we hold it to a monthly meeting through our secretary, we can then determine, she can put it out for her determination as to availability. And as was just stated by Mr. Ward, he has 
certain limitations during certain months of the year, and I would hate to pull them away from something for a meeting if we could have held that meeting at a different date and time. Just, just, just to clarify, I don't have any issues with attending a meeting either by Zoom or by in person. I will attend every meeting as I did in my prior commitments. I will attend every meeting <coughs> that I can, uh, irrespective of whether I'm here or up, up north for a couple of months. So it's not a question of whether I'll attend the meeting, it's just how I will attend the meeting. Okay. Is it true? Yes, Mr. Just, there's a point on that. Um, much like Andrew, last, last year we, we, we did decide on a monthly meeting and then we went off schedule and quite, un you know, unfortunately my schedule gets pretty booked up. Um, at times I'm free all the time, but there are uh, times that my schedule is booked and there were many times last year um, that I could not attend uh, because the notice, the time period of when we're having a meeting was too vague. So there were many times that I could not attend, and there were times that I had to make some some real serious decisions to move, move and make personal changes to attend the meetings. So I, much like Andrew said, I I would I would like to see us at least decide on a time period every month that we, we would like to meet. Now it does not have to be every Thursday you know, the third Thursday every month, but we say the third week or something like that, so we can be a little bit proactive with our schedules. I want to first apologize for the way the meetings were held this year. The unfortunate component to this scheduling is RSM's availability, and RSM's availability fluctuated. So even though we had planned to have a meeting on a specific date, RSM's availability changed, which then dictated a change in the dates of our meetings. So that that's why at this meeting, if we can, I would kind of like to hold it just to a monthly meeting. And I fully agree. I think what we need to do is reach out to RSM, find out weeks, dates, times that would work for them, and then tie that into the schedules of the members of this committee and as well as staff, board members, et cetera. And, and would there be a time with like afternoon or after five o'clock be something where you're more consistently available? I know with my work schedule, it's formally nine to six, but anything in the afternoon, especially at five o'clock after, I have a lot more flexibility than I do middle of the day, so. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. So maybe that's just something we let RSM know. Absolutely. For the purposes of the public availability, does it have to be after a certain period? Does it have to be after six or no? Can it be any time? Not to my understanding. So, the um, so long as it's properly noticed and the public has access, is all that is statutorily required. Um, sometimes we do take into consideration that people are working during the day, so but this is again up to the committee. Thank you. Good. I would still entertain a motion. So I'll move that we uh, plan to meet on a monthly basis, um, unless otherwise required to change at discretion of the chair. I'll second that. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, the motion is to meet on a monthly basis, unless otherwise changed by the chair. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Let the record show that the motion was unanimously approved. Okay, with that conclusion, I would like to open up discussion from the superintendent. I greatly appreciate what you said over the phone, but I'm sure that there was probably more that you would like to bring to our attention rather than deal with traffic and trying to get here to this meeting. I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to call in. Thank you to Dave for, for setting that up. Um, as I stated, I've been about 14 meetings in with principals, assistant principals, teachers, support professionals, um, all separately, uh, meeting with them in separate groups and taking the time to lend their voice to some decisions that are forthcoming. 
Um, I can't speak highly enough about this committee and the importance of the work this committee does. I, I jokingly said, I don't know that you were present, but um, everyone should come to the meeting. Uh, unfortunately, it's done in executive session because it's about cybersecurity and other things we have to do to ensure that our technology and our student data is protected. But it, it is a foreign language when, when they get started. And it's really impressive to hear uh, the presence of these people in the room understand that. The other aspect of it is, is I do believe, quite honestly, that that auditing is a huge piece of improving the school district. Um, it is a continuous improvement process. It's kind of like we do, um, we plan, we start to execute, and the most important thing is we check. In a sense, the audit committee has a huge responsibility to help check, make sure what we said we were going to do and how we're going to transpire and move forward with certain projects, certain procedures, certain departments. We have that extra set of eyes on that work so that we can see what we're doing, bringing independent people like yourselves to help us examine the data that RSM follows and other audits that may be conducted by the Auditor General and other people within the state, and then how we revise our policies and procedures to move forward so that we can correct those things. Because any good audit will get you a finding. The key is what you do with those findings and how you prevent the same finding coming up year to year to year. That's that's what we have to avoid. And um, I've appreciated the diligence of this committee. Um, I believe it serves a very important purpose. And I um, look forward to continuing to serve alongside you. I don't have any real updates for you other than there's some amazing things going on in the school district right now. Um, and we are excited about the opportunities moving forward um, with everything from surrounding proximity and how we're going to work to solve some of the transportation crisis our children and our families are experiencing, um, to how we're working as we get closer to what we call PM3, which is a progress monitoring three. As you're well aware, the state changed the testing process for our children this year. We are no longer taking uh, what was referred to as the FSA. We are now taking what's called a FAST test. Um, it's a Florida assessment of student, student learning. Um, that we did a pre-test of it in early September. We've done another one in the course of January, and now we are setting up for the third one, which is the final one. Um, that is the one with the accountability attached to it. Um, it'll give us an idea of where we're moving forward to student achievement in the school district. What I really appreciate about this committee is that every dollar we can find, every dollar and every efficiency we can find, is additional dollars that my chairman and the rest of the board and myself can place back in the classrooms. So I appreciate the work that, that you have done for those members who have been here. And I will appreciate the work that you will continue to do as we continue to look for proper procedures, proper outcomes, but also searching for those operational efficiencies that we can find that will help drive additional dollars to our classrooms and to our teachers. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Mr. Persons. Duh. <laughs> like being chair on the school board, everybody else gets to speak first, and there's nothing left to say. <laughs> but I want to mention one thing. I know I'm learning more every day. And on the uh, campaign trail, one of the things, you know, we talk about the audit committee, but the general understanding was you were only auditing finance. And I was happy to know right when I first got on that you all do so much more through all the departments and things. I don't know if you want to publicize that more at all, but I think the general public, when they hear audit, they think budget only. So y'all do so much more, and we appreciate that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. And the reason I switched the agenda slightly is Mr. Davis and I both made a presentation to the school board last year to advise them as to the difference between a consulting contract and an internal audit. And there was a significant difference and you could see the light bulbs turning on on some of the board members when they understood the difference between the two. Yes, there is a thing called an efficiency audit and we do request that RSM and performance of their audits seek out efficiencies in process but that is not their sole responsibility. Their sole responsibility is to reduce the risk within the right. district from an operational 
compliance and financial standpoint. So to your point, and as you are chair, you set the agenda. If we can clear it through this committee and who they would like to have represent the committee for us to be put on the school board agenda so we can not only educate the new school board members, reinforce with the existing school board members, but also hopefully educate the public as well as to what the audit process entails. I do know we have a joint meeting, I think planned for June, not the exact date yet, where it's the board, audit committee, and who else? The board audit RSM. Oh yes, the RSM, of course. <laughs> they try to get all of us together at one of the meetings, so that is on the horizon there. That would be welcome. With that said, I am not seeing any members of the public. So we'll close Chair, Chair, I yes. think we have to set our policy for public comment. Um, yes, we do. Down, <laughs> looking down for confirmation. Um, and I will not admit to remembering exactly <laughs> our policy from the last, um, or the exact minutia of our policy, but it just was that um, we're going to do everything possible to allow as much public comment as possible. So I think a three minute time, and then depending on the numbers and the math, tear that down. Um, and so if the rest of the committee was fine, I would move that we just pick up the policy that we had previously. I don't remember ever having a member of the public, but um, we can okay. say that that policy was sufficient. <laughs> yeah, and I can go back and look it up and send it out to everybody tomorrow. Um, it was basically if we had, based on the length of time, if we had X numbers, they had three minutes, if they had X numbers. I think we limited it to an hour. God forbid we ever have that. Um, but with that being said, if we do, we had, if it's this many people, but to keep it within the hour. So it basically mimics what the board does. If it's 20 speakers, it's three minutes, 21 over, it two, it's two minutes, and then 30 and over, 30 it's one 20, minute. 31 plus. 31 plus, it's one minute, I believe it is. But it, it um, mimics the boards, but I can look it up tomorrow and send it out to everybody. Hey, I believe it's Mr. Sund. Would you like to make that as a motion, or can we table that discussion for the next meeting? This way we'll have a clarity from what was approved in the list. I'm comfortable just moving and, and improving with what we had. I think what we had worked and was good. Um, if there is concern or someone does want to see it, I'm, I'm happy to wait, but I'm happy with what we have and I think it'll work. Okay. Is that okay? <laughs> now I will open up for discussion. Are the new members of the committee comfortable with the slotted time differentials based on number of members of the public being present at our meeting from three minutes down to one minute? depending on the size of the members of the public. And as was pointed out last year, we had no members of the public at any of our meetings. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. I think it's reasonable. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second to... Mr. Cohen, if you'd give me just a moment. I'm Absolutely. I'm pretty sure I can find it. I remember how to use this. It should be in the November minutes from last year, from 2020. <laughs> <laughs> right there. So in our case, if you can't read it, it cites from one to seven speakers, it will be allocated three minutes each. Eight to 14 speakers will be allocated two minutes each. And 14 to 21 speakers will be allocated one minute each per anything beyond 14 speakers. Yeah, because we limited comment to 21 minutes. That's correct. So, and I, we, we also always have the ability to extend that if we draw enough public excitement to find more than 21 individuals here with us on a given night. But Absolutely, that would be the <laughs> decision whether to extend the amount of time allocated for public comment. With that said, I, I could have talked to cybersecurity for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't yeah, so the rest of us didn't understand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the 
the motion Google on the table translate. and seconded. Sorry. Any further discussion? Then all in favor? Aye. 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 But the minutes reflected it was unanimously approved. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Sec. I don't know if everyone has their calendars in front of them at the present time. I cannot guarantee that we will have RSM at our next meeting, but if everybody can please take a look at your calendars and see what your month of February looks like. And I recognize that we're already February 2nd, so we can either do towards the end of February or if we would like to, the beginning of March. Mr. Cohen, what I can do is I can reach out to RSM tomorrow and ask them to send me dates for the last week of February, last week of March, going forward to like May, um, and then put those dates out to the rest of the committee because they'll give me three or four dates for each week. And then I can put it out and say, tell me what you guys can do. Um, they usually prefer Zoom because they come from Tampa, but they will come down here if given enough notice. Then what I'm going to request is of the committee members to please forward your calendar availability for the last week of February and the first week of March so that we can then correlate it with RSM's availability as well. And the other question I have for the committee members is 6 o'clock satisfactory for start time? We do prefer a 5 p.m. start time. I don't know, we would all like to get home to our families, but we also have a lot of work to do here. And if those meetings do run, some of us may not get home until 9 o'clock in the evening. So I want to be very respectful of all of your time as well. I make a motion to split it in between and start time of 5 30. Can I have a second, please? Second. Sure. Any further <laughs> discussion? The motion will be to commence our meetings at 5.30 p.m. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Let the minutes reflect that it was unanimously approved. To commence all audit committee meetings at 5.30 p.m. With that, is there anything for the good of the order? I, as a new person, I just would appreciate the opportunity to ask a few questions. Absolutely. Um, the first is, is the, the primary role of operational audits or financial audits? All the, it's not just it's, operational or financial, it's also compliance audits. You have to comply with statute, ordinance, any federal laws that would be applicable. So it's, it's not just financial or operational, it is a full scope. Okay. So, so if I put my accounting hat on, when I think of audits, I tend to think of financial audits. When I think of RSM, who I've worked with in, in the past, I think of external reporting and external financial audits. Is that the procedure or the process that uh, RSM brings to us? It would not be. What they're bringing to us is RSM is an accounting firm they do external accounting. However, in the capacity where they've been brought into the district is as our internal audit process. Okay, so rather so than hiring internal auditors, we have outsourced the internal audit so process. So that answers my second question. So we do have an internal audit process, but it's done by ours. Uh, That's correct. Okay. Um, if, I'm, if I may, um, to put it into perspective, an audit universe is comprised of all risks that the school board or the school district may be exposed to, whether it's through procurement processes, HR processes, and, and as we mentioned a few times, IT and cybersecurity processes. So the audit methodology, while there are components that are financial in nature, um, I think we were talking about the half cent tax yes. evaluation and a few others that are purely financial. Um, we look at it from a risk perspective, especially as it relates to not just the County School Board, but other risks that are seen across all school boards in, in, or all school districts across the nation. And that's one of the things that um, RSM brought. The first activity we had to do was perform a risk assessment across the audit universe. And what role does the Financial Advisory Committee play vis-a-vis -vis the Audit Committee? Okay, that I, that I can speak to as I chaired 
Finance Advisory for several years. Finance Advisory Committee provides recommendations to the school board relating to the financial improvements to the district that would be to the benefit of the district as they see it. The Audit Committee is, we are not making recommendations for improvements, we are not making recommendations for efficiencies, what we are doing is we are working in conjunction with our internal auditors to craft an audit plan and also to review their audit program to a certain extent, including scope, to ensure that we feel that the risks are being evaluated in an appropriate manner. So is there a process by which we go through with RSM to identify risks or to identify specific areas that we want covered over a period of time? We start us on a rotating schedule type of... To speak to what Mr. Davis just raised in very well, and since you brought it out, I'd like you to explain it. Sure, so last year as part of their risk assessment process, they actually interviewed members of the school board, they interviewed members of the school district, and interviewed all the members of the audit committee as well to identify those areas that they um, that are being valued as a potential area of risk. They rank those, and then they brought 10 top risk items to the audit committee for us to consider. Those we voted on identified the top three or four that, that went in front of the school board to vote on to contract with RSM to execute on those audits. Okay, so the last question, I guess, is I, I noticed in reading some of the literature that I had available that you get into accounting policies and procedures, internal control policies. Mm -hmm. So when and how do you do that? As, if I may. So, yes, as part, so as part of um, scoping the audit actual execution, RSM will leverage the existing internal policies that the school districts or school board has. That's where they would develop the scope and then they'd focus on those areas within the policies to execute procedures against. Um, so if, if the procedure said, and again, now we're going back way too long, but as it relates to, I think, some of the follow-ups on the HR side that you need certain paperwork done, that's in the policy. They, they actually did procedures to make sure all that paperwork existed. Vaguely, that's the general like. And what they also will do is they will review the written policy and procedures. They'll hold interviews with staff to ensure that what is in writing is actually in process. And if there's a difference between it, it will determine whether or not that creates additional risk, mm -hmm. it mitigates the risk that they may have been concerned with. And what they will also do, and what we have asked them to do, is prior to publication of their audit reports, <coughs> that those reports are discussed with the audit committee, so that we are all on the same page as to how they proceed. The one thing I want to make very clear, we do not negotiate fees, we do not negotiate hours with RSM, we will discuss scope, ultimately it is a school board decision as to how many hours they feel is appropriate based on the budgetary constraints that are performing internal audits. As an auditor, I love them to spend a thousand hours on cyber security. I think the school board would probably remove me from this committee for that type of so, so does RSM certify the financial accounts? They do well? not. They do not. They, they do not do certification. They are not operating as a CPA firm okay. in this capacity. They are operating as our internal auditors. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. If I may just clear from a statutory standpoint. Um, the statute requires the school board to have a board auditor. RSM is serving as the board's auditor in that capacity. Um, the school, and we do refer to, as just Mr. Cohen said, as our internal auditor. But the school district also has an internal auditor who will be sometimes coming to these meetings as well, Mr. Uh, Gatewood. Yes. A number from last year. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clarified. Okay. Have a clarity. What Mr. Gatewood and his staff perform is very different than what the audits and the scope of audits that are performed by RSM. And also for further clarity, not only do we have RSM and Mr. Gatewood performing audits, we have other state entities that come in and perform their audits. Plus we have external accounts coming in and doing their financial audit. So who would the external do the 
external group council. That is not your the auditor general was here in that. I'm sorry? The auditor general. The auditor general came um, in August. They embedded and it's not unusual for them to stay in the district for almost a full year. So so I lied when I said my last question, but <laughs> <laughs> what function how does the function of Mr. Gatewood differ from what RSM does? All right, rather the superintendent answer that question. RSM's scope expands to things like cybersecurity, it expands to things like uh, policies and procedures being followed in our purchasing department. And to the chair's point, not only are staff interviews, but specifically exhibits are looked for. So as you know, in a purchasing process, starting with an intent to negotiate and going through an RFP process, RSM will look at all of those procedural points and making sure that as they follow maybe 10% uh, of what purchasing did last year, they'll look at that. Mr. Gatewood's specificity revolves around the other dollars that flow into a school building. Um, we have budgetary dollars that get placed in our software system, and there are some very strong procedures, and I'll defer, but some computer language that prevent dollars from being moved between categories or being overspent. <coughs> Mr. Gatewood's work primarily revolves around our internal funds. So every time you go to a football game, and you pay your fee, there are hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially that can flow through a high school, for instance. That money has to also be accounted for. That money must be properly documented. It must be deposited on, based on board policy. Mr. Gatewood's function is ensuring that and making sure that those policies and procedures on the internal funds are being followed. So just following up on who, who is responsible for fraud? or detection of fraud, or processes to ensure there is no fraud? That's twofold. Fraud in terms of internal accounts would be Mr. Gatewood. So the bookkeepers have policies and procedures. Um, I, have, I have no examples from the school district of Lee County to share with you. If you want, I could explore some, some places where internal audits in former districts where I have served, how, how, they, have, how they catch things. Um, the other piece is that's RS, that is partially RSM's function. Um, and then the Attorney General, the, the Auditor General, okay. also really looks for that as well. And, and I think to clarify, RSM is, in my opinion, mostly looking towards areas of potential improvement um, operational. and operational efficiencies, um, and probably less, you know, it's, it's probably more guidance oriented than. Um, you know, purely a financial transactional review. So if I could interject, so is, is RSM reporting to this committee, to the superintendent, to, this, to the state auditor? For clarity, RSM reports to the school board, okay. and this committee, through school board approval, may interact with RSM. And I actually misspoke slightly when I said that we review the internal audit report prior to its publication, the school board also may hold a session with RSM to discuss the results of their audit as well. Would they see it before the audit committee sees it or after? That would be up to the chairperson of the school board to make that determination as to how that process will flow with RSM. That's all contract negotiated through contract with RSM. Point of clarity, I believe yes. the cybersecurity, they went through us first. We had that cl uh, closed session because there were some sensitive el elements. And then after that, I think it was presented to the board. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. It was in that particular case, but that was cleared through our board liaison, Ms. Gittins, yes. who cleared it through the school board first that we could follow that protocol. I know when I get the reports, he and I get them at the same time from RSM. He'll send me an email, put this out to the, I put it out to the audit committee, all the board members, Dr. Bernier, Kathy, um, Mike Gatewood, or Amy Desmores, if she is, I put it out to her anyway, so she has it, but I, Mike Gatewood, Gabby, and finance. Um, if it has to do with cybersecurity, I send it to Dwayne Alton, who is the CIO. Um, so whoever is involved in whatever they send me, that's who I send it out to. Um, 
that was determined in one of the RSN meetings last year. How exactly did information get distributed to everybody? Do, do we see it? Does this committee see it first? Does it go to the board first? Does it go to Dr. Veneer first? And it was determined that it goes to everybody at the same time. Right. Everybody sees it. And that's what you're trying to do with it. Okay. Yes. There's a new guy. No, that's quite all right. Yeah, I, I, I am wondering in terms of uh, past knowledge and past uh, audits that have been done, is there a way that we as board members have access to those audits to see what the track is, what's, what is our plan for the next two, three years? Is there, is there a general plan that has been plotted out so we kind of know where we're going? It is all part of the public record. Um, Everybody last year was laughing at me. This is one of two binders that I carry with me to the meetings. The other one actually is in my car, which has all the audit committee, not audit committee packages, plus audit reports. I'm very old school. Some people will keep it on a thumb drive. Some people will keep it paper copy. I keep paper copy so I can jot down notes on the document itself for my own clarification. So, but it is all part of the public record. Um, if someone wants to take the time, I'm more than happy to meet with whoever on this committee, strictly just to turn over the binder <laughs> uh, <laughs> any discussion with them, for them to make photocopies and to coordinate the time when they can then return these binders back to you. Can I make a suggestion? Is it conceivable that you send the reports to the audit committee members so they get, depending on their personal preference of paper or digital? Yes. How far back do you want to go? Uh, keep it, keep in mind this committee didn't start until November of 21. That's our yeah. first meeting. It's, so it's anything not, prior to November 21, I will not have. Right. And okay, I, so anything that was prior to February 21 is not existent. In my, in my world, it's in world, it here. Is, it's here. It is but <laughs> as far as I have a copy of it, I do not. Um, I got question, an email question. from Mike about where someone Are we talking about the audit or the audit committee? The audits themselves. The audits, the audits themselves. themselves. Yeah. Right. So I, I think it's the audits that he, he's referring to, right. not, the right. not the committee yeah. information. So right. the RSM um, audits. Do the, we have any? The audits that were done prior to November 21, we did not have the audit committee. Prior to November 21 of 21. Right. So anything prior to that, I am in communication with Mike Gatewood. He sent me a link, and Mr. Ward, I'm sorry I did not forward that to you. I'm just dawned on me that I had it. I have a link of where they would be. Um, now, operational, he was unsure about, but we are right now undergoing a state audit for operational. Um, and I, I couldn't even begin to tell you what audits RSM did prior to the start of this committee. So, if yes. I may, Mr. Chairman, we can provide you any documents that you require because we have the RSM audits. We have all of the audits. It's whatever you would like. If you would please let Ms. Rebels know. And then we will secure the documents. I, Any member of the committee may have access to it. I had requested that earlier. If you, are you copied on that? And you, so I, yeah. I'd like to receive this, those reports. We'll get that to you. Ms. Reynolds, it may be um, prudent to just go ahead and send that link that has okay. those to all of the committee members. Yep. And then we can um, also get the information from our I spoke to our assembly. They're, they're, we're going to make sure we have all of that and we can share that all with you okay. as well. The only one that I can think of is the one that concerns cybersecurity because they took all that information back with them. So, the chair, if I may, there is, yes, um, because of the um, cybersecurity and the um, sensitivity of that information, when we did meet with RSM, that information was taken back. We don't. So, if you would like to see that, we'd have to make special arrangement for you to come in and we can show that document. Thank you. And the reason that I offered is I did go back to basically day one through the Lee County records. Um, for a point of clarity, for the members of the committee, I helped craft the policies and procedures in this committee and design this committee. Um, I take it very seriously what we do here. 
And because of that, I went back, and I, that's why I have the second binder. I also have copies of all the contracts that we have with our auditors, plus whatever Attorney General, Auditor General, excuse me, Dr. Yeah, Veneer has me. I know, I'm sorry. Auditor General reports as well. So whatever reports have been prepared, we also had a consulting firm do an efficiency study. I chaired the Finance Advisory Committee. I had access to those reports as well because there was some risk identified within the efficiency study performed by a third party as well. So that's why I'm making that offer. I'm more than happy to do it through these rebels. I was going to say, Mr. Cohen, if you would like to bring me those binders, those that want paper, <laughs> I will be more than happy. I roll my eyes because my former boss, I worked with CIO and he was anti paper, <laughs> like a very anti paper. So every time I have to make a copy, I think of him. But um, I will make you a paper copy and put it in a binder, divided however Mr. Cohen has it divided. If he would like a jump drive with it on, I have jump drives. I can scan that into through my computer onto a jump drive for you. So whichever way you prefer, just let me know. Shoot me an email, let me know, and I will get that done for you. Keep in mind, it is not going to happen tomorrow. My day is very busy. But um, I will... Tomorrow. I will <laughs> not, not, not even Monday morning, <laughs> Mr. Carrington. <laughs> my own but I will, I will get it done for you. From my own perspective, I'm not looking to go back five, ten years. I'm looking at the last two years whatever has been done in the last few years. That would suffice for my purposes. Okay, with that said, oh, is... Mr. Cohn, I'm yes. sorry. I have one more thing, and I'm not usually chatty Kathy. Usually I just sit over here and do my thing. Um, I received an email asking for information, background information on everybody and names. I can give you names of who is on this committee. I cannot discuss your backgrounds. If y'all walk out the door and say, oh yeah, I was this, 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 and this, that is on you. I cannot disseminate information about you. I cannot share your email address, phone numbers, etc. cetera. Um, so when I put out my emails, you'll see their names, my name, his name, and whoever else. And it'll say, good, good afternoon, committee members. I haven't lost my marbles. I am blind copying y'all, so you can't see that. Um, just FYI for a point of reference that I cannot give information about any of you to the other person because that keeps y'all from discussing on an email not thinking and you reply that it'll come to me but they don't see it so um, that just keeps the, the honesty part of it I guess from going back and forth that's the best way I can explain it is there anything else for the good of the order yeah just yes. one last question <laughs> Um, do we have a scope of what we're going to be looking at over the next two, three, four, five, six months? Is there, is there some thoughts on what we would need to be looking at? Uh, do we have something from the school board, from RSM, that they would like us to focus on? What will happen is you will receive the copies of the reports, the risk assessment, the approved audit plan, at our next meeting, and that's something that we can discuss. Okay. And then we can make that determination as to how to proceed with the year. Uh, we do get monthly updates from RSM, usually at the end of the month, as how they're proceeding with their current audit work. Uh, in the past, we have mandated a follow-up audit to ensure that just because an item was cleared, or we believe that the item was cleared in prior years, that Staff has not gone back to their old ways of doing things and therefore we're creating additional risk for the district. So we did that last year. Um, that was a very informative audit that we had all received and you will absolutely get a copy of that. Thank you. Mr. Chair, one more thing. Yes. Don't forget in our last meeting and I do not have the minutes because I knew we were doing more procedural things. We can vote next meeting. Um, in the last meeting, we had to push some of the audits um, because of Ian. Yes, we did. So there's those coming up. I can't name them off the top of my head, but um, you need this They were all pushed back by approximately. Actually, this year, we should be back on target again. Okay. 
We had pushed back audits into November and early December. They felt that RSM felt that they didn't conclude the audit timely and that it would get us back on track around this time this year. The new audit's being performed, but you're absolutely correct. Um, and I did not bring up approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Um, those will be presented at our next audit committee meeting as well as the minutes of today's meeting. <coughs> Yes. Um, and I, again, once again, I apologize for being late. Um, there are a couple of members, so I'd like to just give a real quick introduction for myself. So I'm Jeff Davis. Um, I'm a senior director of IT compliance for Herc Rentals, um, who are based down in Bermuda Springs. But I have 18 years of audit, advisory, and compliance experience working IT controls, financial controls, and at this external audit, internal audit type of that, uh, functionality. Since my specialty was more in IT, that's why cybersecurity, if you see it, I brought that to the table. So, pleasure to meet the new members. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, perhaps for um, at the next meeting for the um, committee's consideration, based on what Mr. Person said, that there's going to be the joint meeting. I don't know if the committee wants to start thinking about um, what will happen at that joint meeting? I don't know if there will be the time to present the next year's audit plan in Thank June. You. So I just learned that out through the committee's consideration, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And the other thing, unfortunately, based on the way policy is written, our terms expire over a period of time with the board member that appointed us to this committee. We did not have meetings last year after the month of November because of the election. For this <coughs> committee members, their terms expired with those board members. So therefore, this would be the first time this year that we would actually have an ability to meet. So I would like for us to potentially revisit that down the road as to a restating of how we want to handle the termination date of the members of this committee so that we do not lose two valuable months and actually probably closer to three valuable months of meeting because we will not have quorum. And that was with all due respect to any newly elected board member, they still would have the ability as of potentially the first meeting of the new year to replace <coughs> that individual serving on this committee and that is obviously their prerogative. However, it will not stall our ability to have a November and December audit committee meeting. Um, secondly, as a committee, we are all going to have opinions relating to the audits that are being performed. We're going to have significant questions. I, if you feel that you cannot come to a meeting with RSM as prepared as you would like, because you did not have the ability to thoroughly review their audit report. By all means, through Dawn, we can always ask for an extension till our next board, to our next audit committee meeting, excuse me, for having that discussion. I would rather have everybody in this room being fully prepared than somebody feeling that the report kind of snuck up on them. Um, I am running the meeting fairly formally tonight. I tend to let it loosen up a little bit, still staying within compliance with parliamentary procedure, but I do welcome the discourse amongst members of this committee. We don't always have to agree in this room, but when we leave this room, as was brought out and rightfully so, we back the majority decision. With that said, is there anything else for the good of the order? That said, I want to attend a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you.